Okay. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world today. Just thank you for taking the time to join us in this technical webinar, GW Electrolysis and Energy Islands. This is the second EI Live event of the year for the Aberdeen Highlands and Islands branch. We're really delighted to have so many signed up to attend. It's great to see the breadth and diversity of the, the energy sector, supply chain, academia and technology companies represented today. Thank you so much for your continued support. It means a lot to us. By way of introduction, my name is Dan Byrne. I'll be hosting the proceedings this morning on behalf of the Energy Institute. I'm a chartered mechanical engineer by background, currently providing consultancy services to the oil and gas sector. I think it's fair to say I've had a very energy rich career over the last 30 years, both offshore and onshore, here in the UK and abroad, and at both practitioner and leadership roles right across the engineering, operations, maintenance and asset integrity space. I've recently taken up a role um, in the committee of the local branch supporting the Energy Institute, um, really both to support this next wave of STEM enthusiasts joining the energy industry, but also to help me with my own continued professional development, building my own fluency around the energy transition, which is well underway. Before I introduce today's guest speaker, on behalf of the branch committee, I wanted to share a few things with you all, just to keep you up to date with various branch events and initiatives. Obviously, given today's format, it will come as no surprise that most of our events are all online for now, but we very much look forward to seeing you face to face when it's safe to do so. Hopefully that will not be in the too distant future. We will shortly be announcing our events for March and April, so please keep an eye on the events calendar on the branch page for updates there. Sadly, we have taken the decision to reschedule our annual dinner and push that back to Thursday, 7th of October this year. But we only have a few tables left, so please get in touch with us if you want to get involved in supporting our fundraising efforts there. Some of the proceeds for the dinner this year will be going to the Pound for Piper Trust, and that's a charity that's very close to my own heart as one of its trustees. We're also refocusing our plans for the annual asset management conference. So we will update you on this when we can uh, in the next uh, few weeks. Lastly, if you're not already a member of the EI and would like to chat to us about signing up, or indeed um, how to go about achieve achieving your chartership with us, then please drop us a line. We have two membership advisors in the branch, Siobhan and Alison, who would be more than happy to help you out. So let's get moving this morning. Please remember to post any comments or questions um, you have for today's presenter in the chat box, and we'll pick these up for the post-presentation Q&A. If you're using the Q&A box, then please just select all attendees so that everyone can see the questions. But I would suggest that probably the chat box is easier to use. So without further ado, let me introduce our presenter this morning. Karen Rajavelu. Karen's a process engineer working for Bill Vinker Tebedin out of the Netherlands. Karen is part of a hydrogen strategy team within the, the Bill Finger group. She graduated with a PhD from the University of Duisburg Essen in the field of renewable energy technology and biogas upgrading. Karen is also a Marie Curie EU fellowship holder and has worked as a scientific co-worker for the EU funded program. This is a program where she's collaborated with 14 international researchers across 34 in the, in industrial partners and across six countries on a three and a half million euro project to tackle energy challenges. Impressive credentials indeed. It's a great pleasure to have Karen join us today and share some of her knowledge and experience. So welcome Karen and we'll hand over to you for the presentation. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Um, delighted to be here today um, to present uh, the project. Happy to see uh, many have uh, registered and already been interested in this project. Um, today, what I'm going to do is uh, going to try to present um, a concept called um, gigawatt uh, electrolysis on Energy Island and how we came up with uh, such a project and, and what, are, uh, what are the uh, findings uh, that we have at the moment, uh, specifically about uh, electrolysis and hydrogen production in the Energy Island, uh, followed by the design of the con uh, concept, um, etc. Uh, next slide, please.
a little bit of introduction about uh, the, the company that I'm working for. Uh, we are uh, one of the leading service provided uh, in the provider in the process industry. Of course, we are operating in two service lines with four business units and six industries. Um, um, the next slide, uh, slide, Katrina. We're also looking at uh, a greater potential um, and a team uh, within the Bullfinger Group. A portfolio in hydrogen has already been established in the company, and uh, there are a lot of uh, special services that we are providing in the field of consulting and engineering, plant construction, uh, of course, EPC activities. Uh, and maintenance and service activities and uh, technologies focusing speci specially on uh, renewable energy uh, and also gas purification technologies uh, when it comes to hydrogen purification and natural gas, etc. Slide, please. In, uh, to begin with, um, this project came around as a result of energy transition. Uh, as a result of what we see here in this graph, uh, we already see that uh, the uh, sea water emissions uh, that has been um, um, set in order to uh, decarbonize is not uh, really helping. And uh, uh, as we foresee uh, that there must be a huge uh, reduction in the amount of energy related CO2 emissions. And uh, what we see here in this yellow line is actually the current planned and policies uh, that's been uh, developed by the global countries. And in order to reduce this even more, uh, uh, in order to compensate for the uh, decarbonization, we need a huge number of uh, renewable energy flooding inside. And what the three major factors that will speed the energy transition, as we see here, is the renewable energy, electrification, and energy uh, efficiency. Uh, of course, renewable energy, when we talk about that, uh, we cannot uh, uh, avoid talking about hydrogen and its potential in the in the rolling out of this energy transition. Next slide, please. As I was saying, the rollout potential of hydrogen, uh, we're already seeing uh, the uses of hydrogen in various sectors. For example, like we see here uh, in vehicle refueling, uh, in transport, in uh, grid services and energy storage and industrial uses. Um, what what is this uh, important about the hydrogen production is about the water electrolysis that plays an important role. And we've identified that this water electrolysis has a great potential in this energy transition, and uh, as we already see a huge surge in the um, uh, market uh, interest of this water electrolysis, we also have identified that this is uh, this can uh, play an important role in rolling out of the hydrogen production as well as acting as a, a clean energy. Um, um, uh, clean energy carrier um, in terms of uh, producing green hydrogen. So if we go to the next slide. With the concept, with, with a little bit of background of what I mentioned before, um, we, uh, as, as I said earlier, we at Billfinger identified uh, that this uh, energy transition and the impact of hydrogen in this energy transition. And as a result of this, we took the initiative to participate in one of a, a very innovative program called North Sea Energy 3 program. It's a follow up of North Sea Energy 2. Uh, it was uh, further, um, um, it, uh, it, it is an extension of the uh, earlier uh, project and the earlier project uh, of course concentrated on carbon capture and storage via platforms of course uh, the hydrogen production in the island was thought of uh, what we what what is the um, um, the, the importance of Nazi Energy 3 is that um, uh, the scope already begins with uh, uh, the construction of island. So three island variants are identified with different capacities as we see here. Uh, uh, um, a 2 gigawatt, 5 gigawatt, and a 20 gigawatt hydrogen island. Uh, this uh, amount of wind farm uh, will actually be coming into this hydrogen island. And uh, the scope of Billfinger in this part was to produce hydrogen out of this island and, and to see the feasibility, the technical and the economic feasibility, of course, and to um, transport this uh, hydrogen that is produced in the island to the onshore. We also see uh, the, the, the team members and also uh, we could see the partners here. Uh, TNO is one of the uh, partner. It's a, it's a research organization in the Netherlands who are uh, actively uh, working on uh, this concept. 
we go to the next slide. So what we did as Bill Finger Table in, in this um, uh, concept in this project is that we basically acted as a concept engineers. So it was a, a, a kind of a feasibility study. So we uh, uh, took part in the design of island, especially uh, green hydrogen production from electrolysis. Uh, we, we designed every sub operation in the island, be it uh, um, the, uh, the electrolyzer design, the uh, storage of hydrogen, the compression and the transport. Uh, in order in order to do this, we had to do an extensive research of market analysis in order to uh, identify the uh, types of water electrolysis and their uh, uh, potential in, in, in fitting in such an energy island concept. And apart from this, we also did uh, um, other uh, um, stuff such as uh, due diligence, environmental and legal analysis and engineering of the whole concept for, of uh, power to gas uh, facility integration, etc. And finally, we also made a 3D model of the island, how it would look like if, if an energy island is made with, with a concept that we have developed. Go to the next slide. Uh, as we talk about energy transition, not to mention that we also have to talk about um, the um, um, increase in the wind uh, energy that is being uh, foreseen. What we see here today is that uh, in, in this graph, in this picture, is that we actually we clearly see that there's oil and gas uh, decline in the activity, uh, the volume of production of oil and gas decline, and, and in relation to the wind um, activity in the North Sea that is being developed. Um, we also foresee that the oil and gas will uh, still grow a little higher uh, as of now, but after after a period, it, it, it's, it's starting to decline steeply. And um, this has been already realized by the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs, which is why um, um, uh, we see that um, around 50 to 60 gigawatt of uh, wind capacity is already projected to develop in the North Sea, and uh, there are steps already taken. And not to forget that we also see in the report of uh, International Energy Agency that um, 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 due to this energy transition, there's already a huge investment pouring in, in this kind of renewable energy technologies and also uh, the solar and wind investments are clearly dropping down. We go to the next slide. In, in order to uh, foresee this, um, there are three development periods that we actually uh, see in the North Sea that is being developed. Um, we could see these three development periods of a particular year and how many, um, uh, how much of uh, capacity of wind uh, energy that we could foresee in this kind of uh, um, uh, in this kind of scenarios. And what we see here in this picture, the three uh, dots, uh, the orange uh, dots, the smaller ones are basically the planned energy island that is foreseen. So this is uh, uh, this is the po this is pos positioned based on the wind capacity. And and the wind availability and the wave climate, etc. And the whole concept of energy island is 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 basically it'll act as an operation and maintenance base for uh, the wind farm and also as an energy hub for transport. When we uh, see such a force, uh, such a high uh, in increase of uh, wind energy, uh, we of course we are looking at the possible conversion of electrons and molecules, and this could happen by means of uh, producing hydrogen in the energy island. And uh, when we talk about production in the uh, hydrogen, um, production of hydrogen in the energy island, we are talking about the green hydrogen production using electrolysis. We go to the next slide. So when we're talking about electrolysis in uh, energy transition, uh, we need to uh, break it down the elemental composition of electrolyzer. Um, of course, uh, we, we do see a huge uh, um, uh, attraction for electrolyzers nowadays, but we, we, we shouldn't forget that it's still uh, contributing only to the 4% of total hydrogen production uh, that comes out of water electrolysis. Uh, most of the hydrogen that is produced currently comes out of uh, uh, syngas uh, reformer, reforming, and it's mostly going for ammonia production, as we see. Um, 
um, but what we see here in this small picture is is the elemental component. So it's basically an electrolysis cell with an electrolyte um, or water, and then we have uh, an anode and cathode cell. And when we give this electric energy input in forms of electricity, we see gas molecules or the water molecules basically being split into oxygen and hydrogen gas molecules, and these are. Um, um, uh, this basically is uh, an electrolysis and uh, the, the down picture. What we see here is the uh, Nell uh, company that is producing alkaline electrolyze, electrolysis at the moment. So uh, this is uh, uh, this is how it would look like in an industrial configuration. What we see here is is, is a stack configuration or a module in terms of uh, certain megawatts that can be upscaled. Um, we are also looking at um, different types of electrolyzers that are operating at the moment. Uh, uh, of course, there are five uh, electrolyzers, uh, five types uh, or more. Um, uh, but what we see here is the three major type, the alkaline ones, uh, the proton exchange membrane electrolyzers, and the solid oxide uh, fuel electrolyzers. We go to the next slide. There's, there is no uh, electrolyzer that is considered as the best uh, of, of the remaining electrolyzers. Uh, that's what we actually uh, uh, understood. So each electrolyzer has its own advantage and disadvantage. For example, if you take solid oxide electrolytic cell, it's one of the high temperature electrolysis. So we are looking at um, a best available technology option. Um, yeah, that's, that's a slide. So if you're looking at um, uh, uh, industry with a waste heat available, then we would go for um, a high temperature electrolysis such as solid, ox solid oxide, and that will be the best fit because it can utilize the uh, temperature that's available in the industry. Again, it's not a huge um, large scale uh, producing one. If you look at uh, PEM electrolyzer, of course, PEM is uh, having a lot of uh, attention nowadays because of its uh, a little bit of high advantage uh, advantages compared to the alkaline. And what we see here is, uh, if you look into the current density, the third uh, car, the third row, uh, we, uh, what we see here is that the PEM operates a little bit of uh, PEM operates at a little bit high current density compared to alkaline. So if, if there is low current density, it means doubled area. So the, the space requirement for alkaline is obviously getting higher, whereas for PEM, um, the space requirement is very uh, small. Uh, of course, uh, alkaline is one of the mature technology, so it's one of the cheapest as well. So we cannot deny uh, the advantage of alkaline as well. We go to the next slide. When we are looking at these electrolysis, uh, we're looking at the technology dominance. Uh, what we see here in this picture is that, uh, like I said before, alkaline is already a mature technology. But what we see here is that PEM is already exceeding towards uh, alkaline and it's already being, uh, uh, being competitive compared to alkaline. The reason is that because uh, uh, apart from many advantages that I spoke of about PEM, um, alkaline, um, as, I, uh, as I said, since it is mature technology, the learning curve is limited. Whereas for PEM, uh, it, it's a maturing technology and uh, it's uh, it's in a still uh, early commercial stage and we are looking at a steep learning curve and uh, the R&D is, of course, uh, very important for this learning curve uh, and the cost reduction. So, um, um, this is this is uh, an interesting uh, graph uh, to keep in mind when we are look when you're talking about different types of electrolysis and how well they fit in when compared uh, to the technology dominance. We go to the next slide. So when we're talking about the electrolyzer, it's not just the stack alone. There are different uh, definitions, but. Uh, what we see is that the electrolyzer is a whole uh, package, so it's not just a stack. Uh, it's also the uh, in, um, electrical energy that we give in, the clean water that electrolyzer needs for producing hydrogen and uh, the purification that we need that the, for the hydrogen that comes out and also the, uh, the drying part, the compressing part. So uh, 
this is this is uh, usually called the balance of plant um, and most technology vendors uh, usually supply the entire package unit so it comes like a plug-in model so we we don't uh, uh, have to do uh, much on this but rather than um, look look it up as a whole uh, system it's uh, apart from the stack alone go to the next slide so our study uh, for for this particular energy island, we uh, chose PEM electrolysis. Uh, there are reasons for this, three, three main reasons. The first one is the space. Like I said, uh, alkaline uh, has around uh, 100 uh, square meters. Uh, when compared to PEM, uh, it's only uh, 20 uh, square meters per megawatt installed. So the space requirement is very important when we are looking at the construction of this uh, energy island. And uh, the second thing is the transport of raw materials. So when we looked at uh, alkaline, there was this uh, electrolyte that has to be transported. So uh, there is the logistic issue. And when we are looking up, uh, when we are looking at gigawatt scale, there's huge logistic uh, logistic uh, problem that could arise, and that would uh, again um, uh, affect the business case. So uh, we. We looked at a, a PEM that has a, a compact, a minimum space uh, with the minimum export of uh, uh, raw materials and labor. And another important thing not to mention is that uh, we are looking at um, the, the flexibility of the electrolyzer. So when we are coupling wind energy towards uh, uh, wind energy and the electrolyzer, we know that the wind energy is, is intermittent, so uh, we need a system that is able to modulate and uh, be flexible based on the load performance. So this part, uh, there is a lagging in the alkaline when we looked at and which is why uh, uh, PEM has dominated uh, since uh, uh, based on this uh, sole reason. So um, uh, these three things um, uh, favored PEM electrolysis uh, when, we, when we looked into uh, energy island concept. Go to the next slide. So, uh, so far we took talked about the technology of the electrolysis and not to uh, forget that we also have to look into the cost because we cannot deny that hydrogen uh, production or hydrogen conversion is still a cost competitive one. And um, um, I remember in a few years ago uh, uh, when I was doing the research, this this main topic was was a lagging uh, part in, in in rolling out of this hydrogen. But now we already see many subsidies coming in and uh, government Government is favoring the uh, the, the uh, hydrogen production and uh, technology, but still, the, uh, we we uh, we should not forget that uh, electrolysis is one of the huge costly uh, compon uh, comp uh, component available, uh, and we also have to look into um, the comparison of cost. What we see here in this picture is uh, we uh, in the mid 2020s we already uh, seeing that PEM electrolyzers are decreasing in cost. At the moment. Um, uh, we see vendors selling around. Um, there's a common metric for uh, for uh, used for uh, electrolyzer is, is is euros per kilowatt. So we see PEM uh, uh, produ producing at the moment at uh, or selling at the moment around uh, 1,000 euros uh, per, per kilowatt. But already in the mid 20s, we foresee around 700 and 800, and even beyond uh, uh, 2020, uh, 2030, we already see that PEM will actually be uh, at an equal cost of alkaline. So uh, these are the major uh, uh, things to keep in mind when we are looking at different type of uh, electrolysis that we can use for hydrogen production. We go into the next slide again. Um, when we are looking at the CARPEX, uh, of course, it's it's the uh, electrolyzer, but if we are looking at the cost of hydrogen that comes out of the system, it's the function of both CARPEX and the electricity. So we 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 all, we also have to keep this in mind when we're looking at the uh, the business case and the factors that influence such a business case. Um, what we uh, it is very important that the low cost electricity is available for uh, for such a technology to roll out and to to see it in an in an island and to foresee that it is happening. And um, uh, of course, um, we 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 need. Um, um, a system to adapt to this uh, to to the intermittent electricity and to see um, how flexible it is when it compares compared to the electricity price as well. 
and this kind of uh, um, this is one of the important uh, also an important factor in deciding for PEM electrolysis when coupling to wind energy. We go to the next slide. So some remarks what I uh, mentioned a bit earlier um, um, to keep in mind is that um, there, there is a cost reduction possible for PEM electrolysis, uh, even competing with alkaline. And um, um, what we see here is that uh, the cost reduction can come up when we scale it up. Um, so scaling up of the system is is one of the important uh, challenge. The electrolyzer uh, or the or the hydrogen uh, um, roll, rolling out uh, uh, potential uh, depends on. And uh, we also see that um, um, the scaling uh, other other apart from scaling up the technology itself uh, use of uh, reduction of expensive materials in PEM, for example, alkaline uses a cheaper material compared to PEM module, uh, there's an expensive membrane. So uh, these things also affect the cost. So uh, these are all things to keep in mind when we are looking at a, at a, at a future technology and a future island uh, that we uh, foresee. We go further. Uh, till now we, uh, uh, the major, of course, the major part in the hydrogen production is the electrolyzer. And apart from that, uh, we also have to look into the balance of plant, which is, um, uh, like I said, um, apart from the electrolyzer module, we are looking at uh, the step down transformer, the ACDC part, and also the desalination process. So um, we, we do know that uh, electrolyzer needs a pure demineralized water for um, uh, water for the hydrogen production because of the membranes that are being very sensitive to the salt content. So it has to be uh, purified. And uh, seawater is, is one of the best option to utilize uh, when we are uh, thinking of energy island concept and um, uh, we could use the seawater directly I, uh, I uh, but like I said because of the uh, sensitivity of the membrane and because of the cost uh, uh, com uh, competitive of, uh, of the membrane itself we need to look into a treatment process for the seawater and uh, uh, what we uh, we looked at various uh, treatment processes of course uh, chemical desalination techniques and thermal ones, but we go for the reverse osmosis technique. And what we see here is basically a reverse osmosis um, um, process flow diagram from Lentech, uh, which we used as a module model. And um, uh, mainly because uh, reverse osmosis, that, again, does not require um, any extra um, 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 item apart from the uh, uh, electricity itself. So we just have to uh, give some electricity and there's some pressure uh, depending on the uh, salt content of the water. And this can be used uh, as uh, to produce a clean water that can be given to the electrolyzer itself. And uh, apart from desalination, we are looking at byproducts that come out uh, of the electrolyzer. Um, in the energy island, uh, the two main byproducts, uh, one is the heat that comes out of the system when we produce hydrogen and another one is the oxygen. Oxygen, it's also a high purity oxygen. It's around 96% purity, uh, but um, uh, it, it is of uh, a value, of course, but then uh, we, we uh, ignore to look into detail about this uh, concept because, of course, oxygen uh, compression and storage in tanks would require an another space requirement and also transport of oxygen from uh, on, on shore to offshore using vessels and all these things um, uh, made it a bit uh, higher uh, um, study. So uh, this was avoided. Another thing is the heat that is, uh, like I said, the electrolyzer itself is is only 70% uh, efficient, so the remaining is coming out of uh, come out coming out as heat. Uh, of course, heat could also be used uh, when we look into the heat integration, uh, but then um, we did not look into that uh, in this uh, project. But not to forget that uh, there is a, a good amount of heat that comes out of the system that could be utilized within the island for other uh, auxiliary purposes. Go to the next slide. Another major uh, thing that we need to uh, look into uh, is the uh, compression of the hydrogen that comes out of the island. Um, each compression uh, meets a specific end user. So um, 
a system, when we are looking at uh, designing such a system, we also look at keep uh, look into the end user need. For example, uh, uh, when we are looking at the transport of hydrogen using pipelines, the existing infra infrastructure can be used in this case, and uh, you, uh, we can transport the pipeline around um, um, 60 to 80 bar uh, uh, with a compression, and so uh, and hence we foresee a compressor station as well in the island. Uh, but what is important is that um, when choosing electrolysis, we also can uh, go for um, um, the uh, specific pressure outlet. So, uh, for, for example, alkaline does uh, mostly produce um, atmospheric hydrogen at the outlet, uh, although pressurized hydrogen uh, uh, alkaline uh, electrolyzers are available in the market. But PEM electrolysis can go up to uh, 30 bar. Um, uh, this is mainly because of the electrochemical compression itself. Uh, the hydrogen is compressed inside the electrolyte as it comes out, so uh, we need not compress it. Uh, we need not give extra energy in compressing it more. But when I when I when I when I talk about such things, I always say that uh, it's not uh, about focusing on the electrolyzer itself. It's actually focusing on the entire supply chain, entire chain. Uh, so it's the system efficiency that we need to take into account when uh, designing such a process because we can uh, um, uh, try do our best to save our energy in the electrolyzer itself. But then even, uh, if if it has to be compressed even further, then we are already spending extra energy in the compressor. So uh, it's always the uh, end user need and also um, uh, the system efficiency that has to be taken into account when designing such a concept. Go to the next slide. And um, when uh, when we looked uh, into the uh, 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 parts of the island, uh, what we see here is that we uh, first developed a, a 3D uh, a plot plan. What we see here is a plot plan on the on the left side of the picture, and uh, we see some um, uh, space requirements. Uh, and based on that, the island was designed. And apart from that, we also looked into other uh, amenities that would be required uh, for the operation and maintenance. Like I said earlier. For example, the heli deck and heli uh, heliports, and then uh, the quay side uh, uh, for vessels, uh, for technician transfer, etc., for uh, for transport of hydrogen, and uh, uh, these things were also taken into account when designing an island. And uh, we actually came up with an island, um, uh, like a picture what you see here, and this is uh, actually a 3D model. And we also have a short video of this. Um, uh, that uh, I would like to press and uh, uh, and then we could see get an idea of how an island would look like. Is it uh, this is a lot? Yeah. There's a, there's actually an audio in the in the in the video, but then um, it's it's somehow not working. The blue ones is 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 are the electrolysis. What we see here is made. Uh, we made it like a lock and feel design. So it's it's uh, it's, it's a compact design. It's constructed inside, um, uh, in order to have a particular temperature. And there are some rectifiers and transformers, pressure stations. All these are uh, rectifiers and transformers here. Yeah. Oh, it's a short video of the energy island that we designed. Yeah, so um, these are the uh, uh, topics uh, that I would uh, I wanted to present, and it was a really great uh, experience uh, working uh, with other partners. And it's always it's, it's a growing uh, pressure, uh, uh, growing uh, experience for us. And uh, we we had a chance to have a tremendous uh, knowledge transfer between in, in developing such a concept between academia between different partners. So um, yeah, we are grateful for that. Thank you. Karen, thank you very much for that. That was a very interesting presentation. We've got a few questions for you, so we'll maybe just drop, jump straight into those. Um, one of the questions came out, what would happen to the salt produced from the desalination of seawater? 
So wouldn't discharging it into the sea cause impacts to the marine environment? So it's really about how do, how do you handle the byproducts of the uh, electrolysis? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we did not look into that actually, but we do, we did um, uh, look into the impact that it would cause on the on the island. Uh, the the brine that comes out of the uh, uh, desalination process is actually sent back to the sea. So uh, um, handling that uh, would again uh, be a, a, another uh, uh, efficient process, but we did not look into that uh, at this uh, point. Okay. A couple of questions that are uh, related here. So did your studies on the various types indicate hydrogen embrittlement would be an increasing factor on the plant itself? And, and especially around things like the compressors, compressors being susceptible to um, hydrogen embrittlement. So were those kind of issues looked at as part of the study? Hydrogen embrittlement, uh, indeed, uh, that that will uh, play an, uh, play an important uh, factor in when we are looking at transport of hydrogen uh, in the existing infrastructure pipelines. Um, again, we did not uh, look into deeply into that. Uh, and again, what was the other uh, question uh, in the beginning? Yeah, so just generally about the plant itself and hi handling hydrogen and the, the I suppose the metallurgical impacts of that. Yeah, we also kind of, uh, lightly looked into that, but it, there was no detailed uh, um, a specific uh, aspect into uh, uh, such a thing. Okay. So, it, so with a lot of these kind of energy developments, environmental impact assessments are really important. So did the team look at what the kind of environmental seabed impact is of having these significant artificial islands? And did it then go on and consider those future decommissioning issues similar to those faced in the oil and gas sector. So really, would you remove, you know, the complete artificial island or would there be derogation to, to leave that in place in the future? Yeah, there was a, uh, uh, there was a study uh, that was looked into this as well. Uh, it is expected that the energy island does have a lot of negative impact when it comes to ecological uh, base. Uh, but it also uh, understood that it is highly um, uncertain that the energy island will be decommissioned. Uh, so it, that was not uh, um, uh, foreseen as such, like we see in the platforms. Uh, but uh, what was decided is that uh, it, when we are looking at design of such an island, it's not we should not look into this uh, from the stakeholders perspective alone uh, just to see the project development but also from the ecological side so having an integrated design that uh, that imparts sustainability uh, that could uh, if that is done then the then the energy island could also benefit uh, the ecological base as well and environmentally be very uh, favorable for example uh, i understood that the island uh, has, is made up of hard substrate in the bottom that could uh, serve as the um, a, a biomass uh, a substrate for for the biomass to grow. Uh, uh, these kind of things can also be looked into that will favor uh, the environmental, uh, um, um, especially below sea level. Okay, good. Here's a great question. We talk about the energy transition that's ongoing between fossil fuels and these new renewables. Um, did you or did the team look at the possibility of reuse of existing oil and gas facilities uh, as they reach the end of their field life to be these energy islands? Great question. Yeah, uh, we we also looked into that uh, as a as a part of this project. Uh, for one one uh, part being such the pipelines, the oil and gas pipelines that are already existing. So uh, when we look at uh, transporting hydrogen, we don't uh, have to um, uh, install new pipelines. Uh, we could already use the existing oil and gas pipelines uh, with a little bit of um, uh, coating and, and different um, uh, modification, and also the compressor station that also could be used uh, for hydrogen. And when we look into the platforms as well, the, the, there, are, there were studies that we also looked into the platform, which if it could be used as a hydrogen uh, production. In the initial, there was uh, we, we started looking at placing an electrolyzer inside the platform itself, but that was uh, found to be not feasible. So that was um, uh, taken out of the uh, project. But lately, I, I understood uh, from uh, companies like NG or Tractable, they've already uh, uh, starting to develop 
develop a concept of a, of a, a, a non-operational platform that could be uh, housing and hydrogen uh, inside. One uh, major thing to um, um, have in mind when we are looking at such a concept is the space requirement. Um, so uh, if you're looking at large scale electrolyzers, uh, I do not know if, if platforms can still be uh, used uh, for such a space. Um, uh, of course, the weight of the product is, is, is not an issue, I feel, because the platform can house uh, a huge uh, weight uh, in, in terms of transferring, but then the space will be a, a limiting factor, I believe. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good response. I think it would be great to see that you know, reuse of the, the older, more fossil fuel technology to, as you know, as part of the transition. So that would be good to, maybe that's something that will come back into uh, into studies in the future. Just a couple of questions that are related here to the, the, the kind of byproducts or how we produce the hydrogen. So what do you do um, with the oxygen that's produced in the process? How does that get handled? And also is the hydrogen typically measured, metered through, um, you know, a typical metering system or metering skid that we, we would use for fossil fuels and gas. Yes, um, um, we are. We are looking. Uh, we do foresee that. Uh, we do see that uh, hydrogen itself uh, uh, that is produced out of the uh, electrolyzer is a high purity grade hydrogen. So uh, there, there are not many contaminants in the hydrogen that comes out of the electrolyzer. That's one of the advantages electrolyzer poses compared to other technology. So the only contaminant that we see uh, when we are using PEM is the water vapor that's inside. So that could affect the. Um, uh, uh, the, the downstream part. So we do um, uh, have uh, some metering and, and quality check uh, devices installed um, uh, to, to see for that. And uh, answering to your other question on uh, oxygen, like I said, hydrogen uh, and oxygen, they are also uh, high purity grade oxygen that comes out of the um, uh, plant. And uh, that could also be used uh, if it has a commercial value, but of course we need to look into the distance uh, from the coast and uh, the feasibility of uh, compressing it uh, uh, again um, um, in in the in the island itself. And would it cost more uh, to do that, or is it feasible business wise? Okay, good. A couple of related questions. You talked there, uh, Karen, about the. You know, the location of these energy islands is typically fairly far offshore. So you mentioned earlier in your presentation that seawater is the best medium for electrolysis. But I suppose the question might be, can fresh water being used, you know, thinking about, you know, use in maybe rural areas where there are significant fresh water supplies, you know, lakes or dammed waterways. And an added kind of um, question to this is, why offshore and maybe not more onshore or coastal related where maybe the environment's a little bit more stable? Yep, uh, that's a good question, um, but I forgot to inform that actually in as a part of a study, we also looked at onshore, the same concept offshore, but also onshore. And uh, there was no difference apart from uh, uh, the cost. Of course, onshore production is much cheaper compared to the offshore uh, uh, production. And regarding the use of seawater when we are onshore, uh, the best is to, of course, go for the water available nearby. Uh, we could also we could use the fresh water. We checked into that as well. But uh, what you see here is the amount of water that is required in gigawatt scale. That's really huge. So uh, if if we have to uh, if if such a water availability in volume is 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 required, uh, is it feasible? Is it economically wise to use that? Uh, that's that's a question. That's a point to think. Uh, but when we are looking at offshore design, uh, when I when I talked about the desalination of the seawater, it's it's not something new that we are doing. Uh, it's in the Middle East. It's been uh, done years after year. So uh, it's an already established technology. So there's already uh, a, a huge amount of water that's been uh, uh, desalinated. So um, technology is uh, is there available and it's cheaper and uh, it, when it, it is wise to use when when the water uh, which water is nearby. So we don't want to take the fresh water and then uh, use it uh, if it's not available in in such a huge volume. Yeah, yeah. So so I, I think maybe I picked up there that it's not. 
Um, it's not definitively always going to be far offshore. It could be more coastal related. Re really just depending on all the kind of infrastructure challenges, availability of transportation links, and as you say, the kind of natural product availability for the electrolysis itself. Yeah. And another okay. point that I would like to um, uh, say, Don, is that uh, when we are looking at bringing the electrons to the shore, um, that it's a cost uh, that that seems to be costly compared to bringing molecules to the shore. So if we want to, uh, if we have a wind farm and then we are producing such a huge amount of uh, electricity and bringing all the electrons uh, through cables and then uh, converting them at the molecules onshore. So we need to look how this affects when we are taking the electrons then and there and then converting them into molecules and then using the existing gas pipelines to transport them so these factors have to, has to be assessed business care business wise and then uh, has to be checked how it is feasible so when you look at that assessment of um the technological challenge of doing this did you also did the study also look into the kind of safety and risk factors associated with you know quite a concentrated um production of such a high volatile gas on on one of these energy islands Karen yes uh we did not uh looked in detail about the safety uh risk and the legal aspects of that uh that was uh, a bit uh, later of the project that came up but then uh we should not forget that hydrogen is of course a high risky uh, uh um, element so it is it is a riskier than natural gas so um but but we also uh, need not forget that such huge amount of hydrogen has already been uh, uh produced as a town gas in those days and uh, there were some um, risk associated with it but still it's it's not something that uh, that is not feasible or that is not operational and uh coming up to the standards uh, there are, there are still a lot of uh, standards for safety standards that are being still developed for hydrogen so uh, there's nothing standardized yet i believe uh, or at least uh, we are clo moving close towards it but there's no clear cut uh, standardization that is available like we have for oil and gas uh, um, um, products okay uh, this is an interesting question, and I suppose it kind of ties into the whole energy transition away from fossil fuels. But, you know, when you looked at developing these energy islands, is there any concerns or consideration up front about the potential impact of rising sea levels on these kind of facilities? Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Uh, but we we uh, did not uh, uh, we uh, in the sense as a part of Will Fingers, our scope was not in that. But um, I do know that there are um, 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 points that uh, has been considered in this uh, the the report by other partners. I do know that there is a little bit of movement of the island uh, uh, itself uh, that's already there in the North Sea. So these these things are also taken into account, I believe. Okay. So you, you, you talked about um, the comparative cost, particularly around things like um, the, the electrolysis using PEM or, or, or alkali, but how does the energy unit cost of all of this compare either with direct renewable energy, so maybe wind energy, for example, or the fossil fuels? You, you mentioned CapEx in the region of 500 to 1,000 euros per kilowatt. So where is the where is the incentive for the typical consumer to maybe switch from natural gas to hydrogen? Is it an economic thing, or is it more around you know being part of that behavioural change of of the push towards net zero? Yeah, I I think that this is this is an interesting question, but uh, I believe uh, uh, for for a consumer to look into this uh, is is a bit difficult because we still have uh, natural gas and fossil fuels dominating the 
uh, in terms of uh, cost. So they are uh, uh, cheaper compared to hydrogen production itself. And if we look into the electrolyzer, they are, like I mentioned in the presentation, they are one of the uh, cost, uh, highly cost competitive ones. Then they are, when we looked into the island concept, uh, the major factor, uh, cost factor was the electrolyzer itself. It was not the balance of plant or anything else. So. Um, it is costly and it is cost competitive and um, it will be a difficult factor in, in uh, not just the CARPEX or also the OPEX. Like I said, the electricity price uh, is also uh, uh, dominating the uh, production of hydrogen. So it will be a difficult uh, factor in deciding when to switch from fossil to uh, use of hydrogen. It will um, uh, involve uh, still a lot of um, with the help of a government. I think it's possible to proceed like we see it now. Okay, just go back to the whole concept of the energy islands, Karen. You know, and these being offshore, um, what, what were the kind of considerations you looked at in the development of the design of the islands? Are these, I suppose, the, the questions are: Are these kind of seabed fixed? Are they potentially floating island opportunities? How? But what's the design concept overall, or will it vary depending on the final location? Um, uh, the design of island, you mean um, um, the structure, the construction of the island itself. Uh, that's what your question is. Done, yeah. Right? Well, I think the construction of island uh, was was done by a company uh, called Dima, D Dima and Boscalis. They were involved in it, uh, and I believe that they. Um, um, I understood that uh, the different. The, it was location specific, of course. Um, and these artificial islands uh, looked into the wave climate, um, the feasibility of the wind farm uh, itself when, desi when, when deciding the, uh, the, the location of the island. And the construction of these artificial islands uh, uh, were, were similar to the ones we did in, uh, similar to the ones that they did in uh, Dubai. Uh, the Dubai uh, artificial islands uh, are, are also um, uh, one of the good examples. Uh, so uh, we couldn't say that it, it is not uh, something new. It was already there, um, but there were certain aspects uh, uh, such as uh, the the wave climate uh, and uh, the ecological uh, things that were taken into account. Okay, then we got time to squeeze in a couple more questions. Um, it, it's just been recently announced in the news that Denmark have reached a landmark agreement on construction of an energy hub in the North Sea. So, you know, very much a, an artificially constructed island. So do you see this commitment accelerating the development of the energy island concept perhaps quicker at a quicker pace than was originally envisaged? And if so, Karen, what do you think could be the pitfalls of um, pursuing this too fast? Yeah, when we started this energy island concept on, we uh, it was uh, something very uh, 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 like like a, a story like a, uh, uh, we could only imagine it uh, when uh, so it was also kind of difficult when uh, when we looked when when we could envision this but when when i see now already that denmark is already um, um, starting to look into this one uh, in a feasible uh, condition i could see that uh, what we did was not something um, uh, that will go uh, away, but it's still happening and it has to happen uh, as a part of um, uh, energy transition. And uh, but 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 the pitfalls, if if you ask me, uh, is that there are still um, great areas in in construction of these islands, and the knowledge that is uh, uh, that is uh, still not clear or evident for um, uh, for 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 people to do, to go for to proceed with. So uh, there will be difficulty in in uh, in understanding certain aspects of this uh, um, gray area that has to be addressed. Uh, I believe. Good. Um, question here about the PEM technology that you mentioned. You said that that was still in those early stages of development and commercialization. But do you have any kind of feel or understanding for what the current and future cost differential would be between PEM and, say, the more mature alkaline technology? Yes, um, like I mentioned in the in in the in the slides, uh, uh, the vendors at the moment specify PEM as uh, one thousand uh, euros per kilowatt. That's the uh, base to start with. 
but already in the mid 2020s, uh, they foresee around uh, 700 to 800 euros a decline in the cost. And beyond 2020 or 2030, uh, what the experts predict is it will be around 500 euros per kilowatt, which is at which is the present cost of alkaline. So the PEM is there, but it's not already there. But in the future, we will we do see that PEM and alkaline uh, being almost uh, same uh, cost. Okay, maybe just one last question that we can get um, squeezed in before we close out. So. Obviously, business case is important when you look at the economics of one of these energy islands, but also what about the kind of technical performance? So what is overall maybe electrical efficiency, including the water purification, the compression? How how does that all look for one of these energy islands? Just, just how technically um, reliable, high level of uptime would you get from one of these uh, these facilities? Yeah, uh, when when we're talking about the technical feasibility, the only part that we struggled in understanding was the electrolyzers, uh, electrolyzer. The rest of the part was was not uh, as difficult as it was because uh, um, a struggle between AC or DC um, um, current is, is is there from the early 80s. It's, it's already there, so the technology is already established once. When we talk about the uh, uh, desalination process, like I said, again, it's been done. Uh, it's 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 been done uh, like a primitive technology in the Middle East. So uh, uh, also the compression part, uh, maybe a compression of hydrogen is a bit different than uh, other gases, but uh, but that is not something very uh, new. Uh, we already have technologies uh, uh, and experts that who can uh, uh, very well uh, decipher these things. The only part that was missing uh, uh, to understand or to figure out was the actual electrolyzer itself, because that's a new technology and we do not know how the scaling will look like. At the moment, we only have small scale designs and uh, not to forget about the balance of plant. So uh, the electrolyzer itself is, is like a stack module. So if we want, we can uh, upgrade it to 50 megawatt or 100. But then what about the balance of the plant? Are we going to design it, uh, the compressor? Are we going to design it for that 100 megawatt but then operate it for 50 uh, are we going to uh, how, how is the system uh, designed uh, is it two times uh, um, um, is, is one compressor uh, lying um, uh, idle so these kind of things um, is, is, is it was lagging and these are important things that has to be taken into account when we're looking at the technical feasibility. So uh, the scaling up is very important. The challenges in scaling up and the balance of plant. Uh, how do they, uh, uh, um, how do they um, in, um, collaborate uh, with the scaling up is very important when you're looking at the technical feasibility. But technology as such, like I said, uh, was uh, is only the electrolyzer, which is uh, new uh, to explore. Okay. Well, listen, thanks very much, uh, Karen. That was an excellent presentation and thank you for fielding so many questions. Um, sorry, we haven't got to answer every question. We'll try and maybe do some of those offline. I thought, presentation today, Karen, was really informative. And I think um, for a lot of people, it's probably whetted the appetite around the whole energy island concept, certainly not something I was overly familiar with. So personally for me, um, you know, great learning opportunity today. So thank you for the time and effort um, you've put into this and for joining us today to present. Uh, I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for attending and, and more importantly, for participating. Um, just to remind you all, there'll be a copy of the recording and the slides will be sent out in a couple of days' time. Just let us do the, the final administrative tie-up. Uh, I think, as I mentioned at the start of the, the, the webinar this morning, if you do want to discuss any membership or presenting opportunities at an event with our, our local branch of the EI, then please do uh, email us. You can get us at aberdeen at energyinst.org. Um, I would encourage you to please keep an eye on the branch page for all upcoming events. Um, we will normally post those fairly regularly, but you'll be notified by email as normal as well. So please keep a lookout for that. R really important to continue to support all your professional bodies through what's been a challenging time. So not just your Energy Institute, you know, whether it's uh, the IMEC, the IKME, 
uh, and all the other various institutions. They really do need your support during these challenging times. Um, so I would encourage you, just with all the challenges around um, uh, information retention, just make sure where you are signed up to your professional uh, organisations, just make sure your accounts are up to date and that you've got the right data for you. Um, all it leaves me to do is, again, thank you all for, for your attendance at today's events. Um, it's been really informative. I know it's a challenge through these times to um, have to sit through so many webinars, but um, hopefully um, the subject matter does pique interest, gets people thinking about the challenges and particularly our sector has gone through uh, in, in the energy space. You know, just even this last two to three years, uh, um, the transformation has been uh, significant. So uh, really important that all of us working in the energy sector continue to be part of that discussion. So thank you again, um, wherever you've joined us from today. I hope you found it useful. hope you found it informative. And we very much look forward to you joining us again at a future event. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.